Another episode of Media Essential Workers. I'm Raza Siddiqui. I'm joined today by Derek Robinson. And this is going to be an interesting one. I'll tell you, uh, let me set this up. Let me take you back 20 years. If you think I'm a high energy guy now who's kind of all over the place, you should have met me 20 years ago when I was just starting in this industry. Uh, I was in the middle of hustling at uh, CLTV, also working at Univision, also doing a stringer business on the side. So I was kind of doing a lot of things. But I remember very clearly, as a matter of fact, I went out on a story once I don't remember much about it. I remember it was a ballpark and Derek approached me. He's like, Hey, you're new. Um, where are you coming from? And he took the time to get to know me. And as you know, in the broadcast industry, there's veterans who have been doing this a while who have established themselves. And it really kind of, um, I just found it great that someone who I respected in that way, someone who I kind of wanted to get into where he was, he was at channel seven at the time was taking the time to get to know me. And I, that was one of the things that really kind of put me on the trajectory to um to want to establish myself and and grow in this field so i'm going to now take a moment so that's why i'm very lucky to interview you derek um and get to know your story because you got to know my story that day i want all of us to kind of follow along with um how you decided as a young boy a young man growing up uh, in the west lawndale neighborhood that television was the track that you wanted to go on tell us your story where are you coming from derek well raza um growing up in chicago uh um, newspapers, TV, they were king. You know, people follow them faithfully. Uh, and that's how we got our news. You know, we had the Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times, and the Defender as far as papers. Um, when I was a little boy, we just had NBC, ABC, CBS. We had WGN. Fox wasn't around then. So uh, I would say about 1983, and Scoop Jackson, if you're hearing me, I'm not plagiarizing you. I'm not stealing from you, but brother, on that 30 for 30 documentary, documentary, you said it best. Chicago, especially for African-Americans between, in the 80s, especially between like 83 and 87 was really a golden era. It started in 1983 with the emergence of Harold Washington as our first black mayor. And for those who, aren't from Chicago, that was our Obama. If you could have seen everything that transpired in, I mean, that was our Obama back then. Um, Oprah coming to town, Michael Jordan coming to town, the 85 Bears emerging. And I think it kind of coincided with Harold Washington, his unexpected death in, uh, in his office in 1987. But during that period, and it, I would say it was 1984. I want to say maybe the day before Thanksgiving. There's one story that I gravitated to and made me say, I want to get into TV news. And that's the death of high school basketball star Ben Wilson, who was tragically killed by a teenager my age. He went to Simeon High School. And I could just remember the coverage of that story. And I remember the emotion and, and how it changed policy in the city and how the city came together and how people just grieved. And I just remember watching coverage after coverage. And I'm just looking like, I want to do this. You know, I, I, I really want to do this. And so that led me on the path to say, you know, okay, I, I would like to do this, but how do I do it? I don't know. I don't know where to start, you know? So tell me about the emotions of that, that that kind of conveyed to you that made this story a little different. Obviously, you said it was someone from your community. I grew up on the East Coast. I'm not mm -hmm. familiar with this story. What yeah. was it about this story that really resonated with you um, and got you to, to the point where I'm like, I, I want to tell a story like this? I think because he was a high schooler. He was a senior. I was a freshman. So and it was I'm, someone you knew personally? I did not know him personally. Not at all. Not okay. at all. I just knew he was the number one basketball player in Chicago. I remember being in the locker room and I remember two seniors. No, one senior was already in the locker room and another one came in and he just said, uh, hey, man, ben, ben Wilson just got shot. And we all just paused and looked like, wow. So we thought, OK, he got shot. He's going to go to the hospital. He's going to be fine. He wound up dying. And, and it remind you, he's the number one high school player in the nation. I mean, he was that great of a player. And so you see the emotions of students breaking down at Simeon, not even Simeon, from neighboring schools. Rival basketball players rushing to the hospital to check on, you know, the Simeon teammates, dignitaries and the mayor and everybody going to the hospital. 
the strength of his mother talk. Now that was the thing, the strength of his mother talking to the media. Her son is dead and she's not shedding a tear. She's talking eloquently. And that just hit me like, wow. And, and I just said, man, I, I would, I had emotions, but I also, how could I put it without, without sounding insensitive? I knew that was something I wanted to be a part of. Wow. So, so tell me about your journey from, from realizing that you had a dream to kind of cultivating your path to make sure that dream comes true because I'll, I, and I'm going to share my experience and sometimes I do this a little much. So stop me if it gets uh, a little redundant, but okay, I'm stopping. I, I'm just playing. I'm just so, playing. No, let's hear your story. <laughs> because again, here's the thing. A lot of people who, who have chosen this industry, mm -hmm. like yourself, had that one moment where they saw something and they were like, this is something I want to be part of. We do this because we want to tell a story, right? You don't get into this necessarily because you want to make money. You, you, you want to do this. You want to do that. You yeah. want to tell a good story. You, you want to put your contribution into community. That's what local news is about. How did you go from a, a kid who was affected by a story, realizing that this was something you wanted to do to, to making that dream come true? I think the bridge started at uh, my alma mater, which is Gram Grambling State University. Okay. I decided I wanted to go to the HBCU. And uh, originally I was going to go to Jackson State. I had a aunt who uh and in fact your uh your co-worker uh kenneth wester is a alumni of jackson state he's also my fraternity brother also but anyway i had an aunt call me one day she said why don't you look into grandma state i just got my master's from there mm -hmm. i looked into it and the thing that shocked me about gremlin was i was shocked hmm and it looks like we may have momentarily uh, lost Derek here. Uh, sorry, maybe you can work on that over there. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Hey, look at I'm, you. I'm back. Just enough to give me a little bit of yeah, a heart palpitation yeah. and, and steal the show, bro. Continue the story. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm so sorry. Make sure that thing is plugged yes, in and full notification. Too. Can you hear me still? Hear you just fine. He Okay, so yeah, and, um, and I was just in the middle of like like I was engaged in the story too. So to pick it up, um, you 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 were told you were advised that this is some some place you should look at, and you were in the process. And it, when it has it has a great history. So I looked into it, and I was very shocked. I was I was part of a scholarship program. Uh, it was my school, my grammar school on the um, west side, Blessed Sacrament. Everybody, okay. we were all alumni of that school. We had a scholarship program with uh, the Oak Park River Forest community. So a lot of people like bankers and lawyers, they sponsored us. <laughs> so we had a breakfast one time with these guys. And uh, one of the guys asked me, Derek, what school are you interested in going in? And I'm, I'm like, uh, Grambling State University. In my mind, I'm saying, they don't know what I'm talking about. It's HBCU, they don't know what I'm talking about. One of the bankers looked at the lawyer and said, hey, man, that's your guy, Eddie Robinson. Eddie Robinson was our football coach at Grambling. His, his, I mean, a historic figure. And they started shooting all these statistics and everything. I said, you guys know about that? And they were like, yeah. So I finally decided to go there. Uh, I get there. I don't even check to see if they have a TV program. I just know <laughs> I want to go to school there. So we're in the hallway hanging out. And um, we're in the hallway hanging out uh, in the dorm. And a friend of mine, Greg Gibson, who we call Fish from St. Louis, we're talking. And I said, he said, what you major in there? I said, man, I would like to do TV production. He said, man, I work at the TV. I just started working at the TV studio here. I said, we have a TV studio? He's like, yeah, come on over. So everything's coming together at this time. Now, now you're where you want to go. You're finding that, that what you want to study is available? For a moment, it came together. So I, I went over there. I did a couple of things. But, you know, being young and a knucklehead, I'm not consistent. So one day I missed the production and this man who outside of my father and my uncles is probably one of the most influential men in my life. His name is James Penny. He was the director of the TV center. He pulled me to the side. He said, you know, you missed the production today. I said, okay, I'm sorry. He said, you want to work over here? I said, yes, sir. He said, don't do it again. You know, he said it like that. <laughs> I took it seriously. And so he gave me the opportunity. I worked my way in and I became, you know, steady. I became a fixture over there. And that program, we 
produced the newscast. We shot all the sports games. We even traveled with the football teams. Either we drove or we got on a plane to go cover uh, the football team. Now, and, now was it like a, a a paid job, or was this just part of a a program that invested that much into what you guys were doing to learn about news? Let me say this: some semesters it was paid, some semesters it was the love. So, <laughs> you know, go figure. It, it, it was more it, it was it was more love than paid. But and it sounds like some tough love too, because it sounds like you didn't want to disappoint uh, anyone again, right? You wanted not, to not at all, not at all. And I started making friends over there, and. And, and and we became a family. We just became a family. Till this day, we are a family. Tell us some of the highlights. You said you were traveling. You, you were kind of going things. What? Uh, tell, tell me something that sticks in your mind. If someone says, tell us about your college experience. What are, was you saying, your... are you saying as far as TV related? I, tell me both. Tell okay, me I both. can tell you uh, myself, Mr. Penny, and my buddy, uh, James Reed. Uh, who was a um, technical director at uh, our sister affiliate in Atlanta, WSP. Uh, I can remember us flying into Detroit on a Thursday. And it's always stuck with me. And we got the rental car. We loaded up the equipment. And that was probably one of the best trips we ever had. But I remember us getting in the rental car and we're driving. And a special report came over the radio. And... Uh, we were laughing and joking at first. And then a special report came on and press conference, they broke into a press conference and Magic Johnson announced that he was HIV positive. We all just got quiet. We didn't say a word for like the next half hour. It just, it just paralyzed us, you know? But other than that, I mean, just, just the traveling, getting to meet people, going to different venues, you know? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so, so you you have a good time in the college program. You meet uh, a community of people who you're still close to. Mm -hmm. um, like most people, there's that first job. You've already gotten used to not making a lot of money all the time, all of the instability of the industry per se. Um, we were talking before we went on air here. Tyler, Texas. That's mm -hmm. what I came calling for you. Tell us about Tyler, Texas. Well, I'm going to tell you. Mr. Penny actually set up an interview for me and Tyler. So uh, <laughs> one of... Uh, well, he wasn't my fraternity brother. Yeah, he was a player. G. I have I had him drive me to Tyler. <laughs> How far of a drive would that be? For, uh... From Gramley, it was two and a half hours. Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't. That, that, you still owe him a couple of cases of beer at that yeah, point. Yeah, you know, it's not. It, it, it wasn't. It wasn't that bad. The interview went well. Uh, the, uh, my boss called me. The, well, my future boss called me and said, you know, you know, we got this for you. It's part time. Can you do it? And I, and I said, man, I'm not doing part time. But by then I had gotten very arrogant because, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I, you know, myself along with a couple other guys, we were like on the top of the heap at the TV center in college. Right. So I got arrogant. I'm not, no, I'm, uh, nah, I can't take part time. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, you know, if you ever change your mind, call us. Graduated, went back home. Uh, and I, I maybe need to backtrack a little bit. That that same semester, I I had a tragedy happen to me. Uh, uh, I lost my father mm. uh, a couple of months before graduation, so that kind of weared on me a little bit, you know. So I came back home after graduation. I could just remember typical Chicago winter, cold and and, and and cloudy, and I'm applying for jobs everywhere. I, I'm going to work in Chicago. I'm not going to a small market. I'm going to work in Chicago. Nobody would bite. Nobody bite. I did get an interview in Rockford, and I flubbed that interview. Mm. <laughs> I messed that interview up. And later on down the line, I'll tell you about the woman who I interviewed with. I actually ran into her at Wrigley Field years later. I'm going to uh, make a note here, ask about the flubbed interview. Because, right, right. <laughs> I, 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 I do want to hear that story. Right. So anyway, uh, my buddy James Reed, who I told you about, he was – the technical technical director in Tyler, he um, he uh, called me saying, hey, man, I got this position open if you want it. I said, I got to take it, man. I, I can't find anything. You know, cause I, it got so bad. I was about to go, you know, just work at the airport and be a bag, baggage handler, you know. And uh, so the uh, Bob Love lady who was my future boss called me. He said, when can you start? I said, I'll be down there in two weeks. 
So I told my mother, you know, she took me to the train station and boom, off I went. James met me, took me to the station. I stayed with was him. Was it still part time? Was it part time at this time? It was part time, but it actually gave me full time hours. I worked a lot of overtime. So, all right. All right. Yeah. So you went out there, cooled your heels a little bit, uh, yeah. focused a little bit, and decided it's time to go back uh, to Tyler, Texas. Um, how long did you spend down there? August, no. March 1993 to August 3rd of 1994. The next question I'm going to ask, because I have no idea where Tyler, Texas is, what kind of a news market it is. Was it uh, good news? I mean, you know, this color in Tyler, Texas. You know what? It's, Tyler is 90 miles east of Dallas. Uh, it's actually called the Tyler Longview Market. Okay. And surprisingly, it's a very good station. Uh, solid talent. Excellent shooters, excellent e MPPA. And for uh, guys that don't know what MPPA is, it's, it's like it. standard standard of shooting for uh, for us photojournalists. They were excellent shooters, but I felt it was very clickish. Mm. I'm just mm -hmm. gonna keep it real. It was very clickish, very biased. Let me, let me ask you this, Tyler, uh, Tyler, it's probably in the uh, hundreds in markets, um, and, and for anyone watching this, there's market hopping, right? Uh, you right. start at a smaller station, you jump up, but how many of the people there were maybe locals who just, this is where they were going to stay, this was the job they had, and did that foster the cliquish nature, or was it what, more what, 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 else? Some, some were local, most were Texas residents, mm -hmm. you know, they were either graduates of Texas A&M or UT, uh, University of Texas uh, uh, in Austin. Yeah. So it was a click. It was a click, you know. And uh, I felt you could feel the bias in this there, you know. Uh, but after a while, you know, just I did what I had to do. And I didn't have a social life. I just, I, I did not have a social life. Um, I worked in a TV station almost every day, you know. To the point where my boss told me one time, he said, Derek, I'm going to have to stop you from coming here so much. You don't have a social life. And I said, oh, man, I didn't come now here to have a social life, you know? Yeah, and, so. uh, yeah. And, uh, and I uh, bet you if you didn't have a social life and you were hanging there, they found things for you to do. And, again, I'm sure that's why you got some of those full-time hours. I, exactly. I my first station, I do but, some of my studying there from school. And they're like, hey, if you're just going to sit here, I'll send you out somewhere. <laughs> you know, they, they know how to uh, – to, get the most out of the opportunity oh, to get the most out of other people. No, man, that, that's perfect. But then I do want to ask you, so you realized it was clickish. You realized it wasn't something that you were a hundred percent maybe wanted to stay there forever. You get an opportunity at CLTV. Um, you get an opportunity. In oh, Chicago. let me tell you about yeah. CLTV. That's pretty funny. Yeah, go ahead. I applied. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, so I applied to CLTV. I kept hearing about this 24-hour news station in Chicago that opened up. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, I'm having the hardest time. And We were just uh, talking actually to Tony Diasio yesterday, and we were talking about the whole time at CLTV. It's one of those places where uh, many of us in this market started, and it really gave us a chance to get into the market we wanted to and really explore and get the ambition out there. So I want to hear about your perspective. Um when you heard about this 24 hour news operation, what you thought you're not in Tyler, Texas anymore. No, I, you know, you went, I was still in Tyler and I wanted oh, to you work are in there. Tyler. Yeah, I'm still in Tyler and I wanted to work there. And so I applied maybe about four or five times. I kept getting rejection letters. I kept getting rejection letters. So this one particular time I, um, I sent a letter and I said, I'm going to be in town for a wedding. I'll be there for two weeks. Uh, and just wondering if I could meet and have an interview. And um, I'm getting ready to go out. And I mean, literally, as I'm about to walk out the door. I'm, I'm in Chicago for the wedding now. Mm -hmm. As I'm about to walk out the door, the phone rings. It's a woman named Dana McDaniels. I'm sure you've heard the name before. She was the operations manager at CLTV. She she uh, said, "Hey, I have a position open. If you like to come in for an interview." I said, "Okay, I I would." So I said, "Can uh, can you come in Monday?" I said, "Most definitely." So I drove down, met with her on a Monday. Um, she showed me around for about two hours. 
<laughs> she said, I have a lot of candidates for this position. Um, um, so it'll be Friday uh, before I contact you. I said, okay, uh, I, I'll wait your call. She called me the next day and offered me the job. I'm like, wow. I'm like, wow. I couldn't wait to get down to Tyler and just uh, uh, tell them, hey, I'm going back home. Yeah. But this is the funny part, though. So I get hired. <laughs> I go to my mailbox in Tyler. I got a rejection letter in the mailbox. From CLTV. For CLTV. So I call. I said, uh, <laughs> rejection letter, is everything okay? She said, please throw that away. Please, just, we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. And so I made my way back up here. And it's no doubt, I would probably say that Channel 7, where I work now, ABC, is probably the best job I ever had. But I think CLTB may have been probably the most influential job I ever had. I'm going to tell you my story with CLTV. This is about you, but I'm going to, um, because it, it draws such a parallel to the story you said. I was in Champaign, Illinois. I was going to the U of I in Champaign at the time. Mm -hmm. I applied a couple times to CLTV, at least four that I can think of. At least they did you the courtesy of sending rejection letters. I never even heard anything bad from them. So I was like, oh my God, I'm completely wasting my time. I drive up there one day. I think I'm visiting my cousin who lives up here. And I call him. I'm like, hey, at this point, can I just take a tour of your facility? Um, end up uh, on the phone with Anita, who a lot of people in this market may know. And she tells me, hey, um, so you have experience? Um, then I hear her talking to someone. She tells me, why don't you come in tomorrow? I come in for what I think is a tour. I, I'm meeting with uh, John Laboda. And, and the next thing I know, they're like, would you like to work here? Sometimes, like they say, timing is everything, right? Sometimes you're just in that, that position, you're in front of them, and you get that opportunity. And it just... Um, like you said, you were here, you got that rejection letter that would have come to you and discouraged you, but you were there, you showed your interest, and, and there an opportunity came for you. Exactly, exactly. And from the moment I walked in, um, um, I was just amazed at the place. Now, if you know the history of CLTV, it was not well liked when it first started. It was a non-union shop, so uh, you can imagine the guys in Chicago was not they were not happy that it, that it came about. So you, know, you, again, were maybe one of the pioneers in terms of starting there, right? Were you one of the well, first? Well, not really. No, I was a year, I, it was a year and a half in already before I even started there. It was like a year, eight months in before I even started there. So it was just enough time for the, the, the guys in the stations downtown to be like, you know what, this uh, non-union shop is a threat. So you didn't maybe you weren't the first in the door. Oh, I didn't you were there. No, the, the initial reaction that, that yeah. people got oh i missed that i i got some of it but i missed that initial reaction from the from the pioneers so the what story. Story. tell me what that's like because i've heard stories and i don't know how much truth there is lines cut this and that but there's always exactly we, 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 we never experienced that i mean maybe the most i ever got was the cold shoulder or something like that you know but i, I never got anything crazy like that lines cut or anything i was young and i think i'd be out of a job right now if i would somebody would cut my line in my face and, you, know, <laughs> I I believe that. So, yeah. you said cltv is one of the most influential jobs you had tell me why it allowed me to come back to chicago for me to leave Tyler, the market like Tyler, Texas, and get back to my hometown. Now, I'm not at one of the big dogs, but I'm at a station that is allowing me to get my hands on everything. I started off as uh, on the studio crew, and they told me when I started, hey, we're putting you on an 18-month contract. Um, if things don't work out in the 18 months, then I, I'm sorry, but, you you know, we don't renew contracts, and that'll be it. And I'm like, okay, cool. I got promoted. I got promoted. Wait, wait so, so you were you were under contract uh, as a behind-the-scenes person? If you worked on the studio crew, it was an 18-month contract. Interesting. Okay. But I say 90% of the people who, weren't, who, who did that, they got promoted eventually, you know? Huh. And I was, there, I was there two weeks. I got promoted, <laughs> you know? Interesting. And full, a full-time staff. I see Victor here also uh, asking about the contract. It's something that uh, so many people can't uh, envision. Um, and a lot of the in front of the scenes people are on contract, but but 
personally, I had not experienced the behind the scenes guy, but again, um, when an operation is just starting up, they're probably doing whatever they can to be uh, fiscally responsible in their eyes or, you know, I'm not going to say anything else, but um, I also do remind Victor all the was people. was one of the first people to train me. Was he for real? Yeah, he was one of the first people to train me in mass control and transmission and in the lab truck. Wow. I'm going to remind people, too, if you're watching this, it looks like there's quite a few people watching here. You can click on this link and join us and ask uh, Derek questions in person. It looks like someone may just have. Or you can actually ask it in the comments, and we'll make sure to get that answer, too. Um, so now you're back in Chicago. Um, you're back in the in the city you grew up in, the city you wanted to get back to. Um, something I'm sure that the little uh, cocky Derek who wanted to get back into the city of Chicago was very happy to do. Um, at what point do you make the transition to Channel 7? Tell me how that happens. Because, again, when you're at well, CLTV, actually, that's kind of everyone's dream. Right. So I'm at CLTV, and things are going well. Um, I went from being a studio crew person to a transmission technician to an editor to <laughs> finally a full-time photojournalist. And so it was after the Bulls championship in 98, the last Bulls championship, yeah. And I'm at the last dance because I didn't see not one glimpse of myself on the last on the last dance. So I'm I'm mad about that. But <laughs> not one glimpse. But anyway, um, there was a position at the Tribune Tower. It was a position uh, in a department called Tribune Regional Programming. Yeah. And what we did was we took pieces of the newspaper and translated them to to video content. And what was important about that job, we utilized technology that other people were not utilizing in in Chicago. Myself and Brad Pike, who's at GN right now, uh, we worked on a server system. They, nobody was doing a server system back in 98. We did. We, I don't even, I'm not sure I even know what that is. Maybe when you explain it, it'll drop my memory, but tell me what that is. If you ever saw Metro Mix and you remember maybe you saw Metro Mix package or anything like that. Yeah, Metro we, Mix. We started that. A Phil Vitale, uh food shoot. That all came out of our department. Okay. And so after a while, our content was so good that WGN started picking up the content. You know? So I'm like, yeah. all right, WGN is picking up the content. This is finally going down. Maybe the money will roll in and we'll start getting paid more. Not a chance. I'm like, wait a minute. My stuff is airing on WGN and I can't. You know, yeah, where are those IBW rates yeah. that you hear about? Yeah, so I remember asking the boss, I said, Could I at least freelance WGN on the weekends? He said, No, I said, Okay, I, 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 it's, it's time for me to make a move and go out on faith. So, uh, Steve Schwartz at Channel 9, he saw me one day, he said, Why don't you give me a call tonight? And I gave him a call. He said, man, why don't you apply at Channel 7, man? Just just call them over there, man. He said, and he was honest with me. He said, you're a good photographer, man. But he said, man, they don't have any young African-Americans over there. And, you know, a apply. I called the next day, Dave Spinelli. I don't know if you ever heard of Dave Spinelli. But I, heard I, called, I, I called him. And I remember calling him on the phone. I said, uh... Hello, my name is Derek Robinson. The first thing he said was, I know who you are. And I froze on the phone like, okay. I said, I'd like to drop a resume over to you. He said, just bring it to the station. I brought him a resume on a Wednesday. Thursday morning he calls me. He said, when can you start? I'm like, whoa. You know? <laughs> and so I put in my two-week notice at the Tribune, and I went over to Channel 7. I'm going to ask you this. We had a couple, uh, maybe it was about two weeks back. We had a uh, discussion with diversity in the newsroom. We had uh, Dante Williams on. We had uh, Kenny Bedford also from your shop. And we mm -hmm. kind of discussed like like um, uh, how, how that's gone historically, how, how it is now, what representation's like. What was it like? You're saying at that time there weren't many African-American photographers. Is that correct? Or young no, African-American? That's not correct. Okay. There were a lot of African American photographers. There were no young African American photographers. I was thirty at the time when I, I started at Channel Seven. Okay. I think maybe the second youngest, uh, Dwight Payne, came eventually. He was a transfer from Houston, so Dwight was ten, 
um, telling his age, I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, Dwight came from Houston. Uh, I think the biggest gap was maybe we had somebody in their mid forties at the time, but they didn't have any young African Americans. So what was it like to make that transition from CLTV? Now you're at, at, at uh, what was Channel Trivial 7 Regional, Big Dogs at that time? Programming, uh, Trivial Regional Programming. Yeah. And then to Channel 7. Even though what was so funny about going to ABC, guys that would never talk to me in the field, when I walked through that door, uh, greeted me with open arms. Gre greeted me with open arms. And there was, I started, I, I think I trained in editing the first day. And people just, man, people were so nice. You know, you knew it was Channel 7. It was that gruff union station. I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. I, mean, I can tell you how many people were nice to me. You know? I just, tell it, me felt like home. it felt like home. It felt like home. Tell me some of the stories that came out of that. Out of that. Tell me some of the things that surprised you. Because again, you said that maybe you had certain expectations, or when you were at TLTV or, or, or regional, you were treated differently. What are some of the stories that, when when you came aboard, that that you remember? I can remember one woman, Bradria Y.E., uh, uh, excellent editor. She's retired now. Uh, I guess because of the lack of diversity, uh, I was going to lunch that first day, and she said. I passed in the hallway. She said, Derek, we're really glad to have you here. I said, well, thank you. She said, we are really glad to have you here. I said, oh, okay, I got it. I got what you're saying. I got what you're saying. But that first day, somebody called in sick. I was just supposed to shadow, and somebody called in sick. Next thing you know, I'm doing like two packages that day. I'm just grabbing, and I don't know the system, but I'm like playing Throw into the wolves, right? Yeah, yes. it, it, throw you into the fire and uh, throw, see how you come out. Throw me into the fire. And, and but I got it done, you know. And I think two days later they they put me out in the field. Somebody called in sick that day. I was just supposed to shadow. Yeah. Oh no, you fire again. That whole week was nothing but fire after fire, you know. <laughs> now, mind you, I applied for a lot of places. WGN, I applied at Fox, CBS, NBC. So I'm at Channel Seven for two weeks. And um, uh, I go home one night, and uh, the ops manager from WGN is on the phone, <laughs> on my answering machine. He said, "Come on out tomorrow. I want to put you on. Um, I want to put you on the schedule." I said, "Okay." I'm like, "Wow, how am I gonna pull this off?" I said, "I called him back. I said, well, I have to work at Channel Seven in the morning. I drive out there once I finish." So lo and behold, I work at Channel Seven in the morning. I'm walking out. My shift is over. They said, uh, they want to see you upstairs. I'm like, oh, boy, what did I do? Hmm. So I go upstairs. They tell me, sit down. Uh, hey, we want to make you vacation relief. Really guarantee you 40 hours a week, but you have to work for us only. I'm like, wow. You talk about timing. So I was like, okay. So I drive out to WGN. I tell the ops manager what happened. And I said, he said, hey, man, no problem. He said, I would take that if I was you. He said, I'm, I'm happy for you, but if anything changes, call me. I maybe was vacation relief for 10 months and then uh, got hired full time. Wow. Mm -hmm. They saw the talent. They brought you in. I want to talk one more thing about uh, the talent that they had. I want to talk a little about um, you went to Rome, right? You went to Rome to cover the Pope. Uh, you went out four times. Tell me what that was like the first time and uh, – Tell me, I mean, I mean, tell me about that experience. My wife and I just came back from Italy on a vacation she's always wanted to go to. And I can only imagine having been paid for that. But how much time did you even have to enjoy um, the Vatican, Rome, everything? Tell, tell us about what well, it's like. Well, you have to remember, we're on a different time schedule. Mm -hmm. So eight hours difference in daylight lights. I think one time daylight savings times fail where it dropped to seven hours. Yeah. But you got to remember you're, you're constantly on the clock. When everything is closed over here in the States, you're working over there. Think about it. It's an event is at nine o'clock in Rome. Yeah. It's one o'clock in the morning over here. <laughs> you know, so you work at a nine to five in Rome and things start to shut down. Now you got to work for us. So if I have to do a 10 o'clock live shot for Chicago, it's six in the morning there. If I had to do a five o'clock in the afternoon shot, live shot, 
for Chicago, <laughs> it's one o'clock in the morning for Rome. You never sleep. You literally, you are taking cat naps. You wow. get you get a chance to eat, but you are taking cat naps, li literally. And it's that rare day they cut you a break where you could go do a little sightseeing and everything, but for the most part, you're just, you're just, you're living off it, express all day long. So you're news gathering during their daytime and you're waiting to tell the story that you've just put exactly. together for our night shows. Exactly. So you're never, wow. you're never sleeping. You're never sleeping. Uh, tell me what that experience was like. Which, uh, which reporter did you go out there with? Um, Alan, was it the every time it's been uh, Alan Krzyzewski, one, one of the best that ever came through Chicago. Uh -huh. uh, tell us what he's like. Uh, working with out in Italy. And sorry, if you could uh, take a look at, we have one guest down there, just uh, take a look. Um, but yeah, Derek, if you could um, kind of tell us what that whole experience was like. Tell, tell me what it's like to, um, to basically you're a team when you're, when you're over there, you don't have a lot of time probably to spend separate because like you said, there's just. We're a team. We're a team. And this is the thing. 20 years ago, if I would have went to Rome, you would have had the back end of the network. So you would have had engineers and everything. When I go now, Everything falls on me. Uh, if, if, if equipment breaks down or, or 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 I can't get that shot out, it's all on me. So I'm gonna tell you one thing I do constantly is I do it here. I you know what? I pray over my equipment. Seriously, I pray over my circumstance. I pray over my equipment. You know, and you know I I just don't want any failure. You, you know so. It, 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 everything falls on me over there. And you know, I don't know if people know how we go live uh, when we're over uh, there. But we, we I, I, I think most of our viewers do, but, but explain that. As much as you can tell us about that experience, I, I think we'd all love to hear. I think one of the things that changed, that changed our industry is the emergence of what we call cellular bonded equipment. For those, for those who don't know, it's a system that usually consists of like four to six air they're nothing but cell phone cards, but they allow us to transmit video, video and audio uh, uh, over a certain IP address. And so we use it all the time in the United States. Of course, when I go to Rome, I can't use cards that are, are from the U.S. I can't use a Verizon or AT&T card. So usually they have a box waiting for me in Rome to use and test out. You know, yeah. so um, um, that technology has been great. And actually, it works better in Europe than it does over here. I have literally been at the Vatican with like a half a million to a million people with no cell breakup. No signal breakup. You know what? There's a guest. Uh, there, there, there's a guest that we're gonna pop on here. Um, I can't even pronounce the name. Uh, oh, yeah, Adam. What's that? Yeah, well, Adam. But real quick, I want to pop up a question. Uh, Victor has here. Um, how much uh, Italian can he speak now, Derek? I still can. I can see uh, what Riva Dirty and Bonjour. That's about it. And I still can't speak any. All right. Yes, Victor, I was wondering the same thing. Thank you for asking that. And um, you want to pop up uh, our guest here real quick, sir? Hey, hey Rob. What's going on? What's up? What's I don't up, have you Jay? <laughs> hey, man, I saw I saw you live. And I just wanted to uh, pop in real quick just to show you some support, man. I appreciate I'm proud of everything you, man. That you're doing, man. Thank you, brother. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would just have to say, especially with the stuff that I do, man, a free press is 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 just vital and for and for you to be able to get you you only have certain moments to get a picture and an image that tells a story that illustrates a story that can they can probably get a point to the audience better than words and right. you do that with skill like no other Thank man so i just wanted to Show I you some love. My friend, brother. See, this is a man at Alpha Phi Alpha right here, man. <laughs> love you got to have some memories of Derek. Tell us one of your memories of Derek from uh, from that time. Keep, <laughs> you know, keep it clean, but let, let's see what you got. Well, I, so you know what? I'm 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 not even gonna do I'm not even gonna do college. I'm gonna do, you know, since we're we're not in our career, professional careers, 
I, I come to Chicago at least once a year. I haven't been able to do it within the last few years or so. I've come to, to Chicago. Derek is taking me. First of all, Derek knows every spot in Chicago where a movie has been filmed. And we're driving through a tunnel. He's like, yeah, the Batman was filmed. Passing by buildings, this is where the Transformers was filmed. He knows everything about Chicago. You want someone that can take you around where every major story has happened in the city of Chicago? Derek is the man. And one thing I appreciate is being inside the ABC studios and sitting and, and sitting at the um, I guess the commentator table and 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 looking at this, I'm broadcasting the news. So I, I appreciate that. But Derek, again, man, I'm so proud of you, man. And, uh, what's up, brother? Thank you, brother. Love you, man. That's Love awesome. You, um, Derek, I gotta ask you, man. Um, so now, something a little interesting about me. yeah, go ahead. Something a little interesting what he mentioned about being in the studio. My my I think my journey, I can actually say, may be a little different from a lot of people who work in Chicago, especially my age and younger. Because yeah. growing up, um, well, people know I'm a big movie fan. So growing up in North Lawndale, we usually came downtown to the movies. And people don't know that Loop Area, especially around by by our station and Randolph Street, was like our many times square. And there were two two movie theaters that I loved as a kid. Chicago Theater and the State and Lake Theater. And what a lot of people don't know is that our studio was the State and Lake Theater. And when I was a kid, that was my favorite block growing up. And God has blessed me to work on my favorite block. Now, <laughs> how, how ironic is that? That is really something. As a matter of fact, when he came and talked about how you knew where all the movies were filmed and all that, I was wondering, was that true? Or is it like when I used to go on dates and I would tell some, uh, a woman I was dating, a young lady at the time, that uh, that constellation is such and such. And then oh, no, those no, apps I, came I, out that I, really I identify it and screwed me completely. Oh, I gave him the Dark Knight tour, you know? I, yeah. I gave him the Dark Knight tour. So, yeah, yeah. And he, hey, mentioned, the the Transformer. Yeah. he mentioned the Transformer. Actually, uh, I could hear Mike. I was shooting something. I think I was in a shot. And Michael Bay was actually yelling over the headset. And one of the PAs came over to me. He was very nice. He said, hey, man, Michael Bay is yelling at me, man. Can you mind moving back a little bit? I said, I got you, man. I got you. <laughs> well, I remember, um, again, I was in my stringer phase during this time, and the Batmobile was racing around Lower Wacker Drive, and they didn't want anyone getting any shot of that. We had to go across the river to get that one shot. Unfortunately, I didn't get it. One of my competitors got it, and that's right. how we got the first shot of the Batmobile. But again, really? um, that's how the directors were back then, is that they didn't want you anywhere near it or with a camera. Right. But hey, right. I, I mean, he was nice enough where he let you... Uh, find the place where you, where, where you could see what you wanted exactly. to do. They, they were nice enough. They were. Even the police were nice to me that day. They even told me the sequence of the explosions on the building. So they, that, I, I appreciated that. <laughs> you know? How exciting was that to, to see the Dark Knight being filmed, even from it a was, distance? It was, it was nice. It was, it was nice. But I've seen a lot of movies. Dark Knight, uh, Man of Steel. Uh, 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 I don't think it was the first Transformers. It, maybe the third one where they first came to Chicago. Uh, I think it was the third one, maybe. I mean, I mean, it's, it, you see so many movies being filmed that it's like, after a while, it's like, eh, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, th th there's a couple of things I want to ask you, too. Um, you came up to me when I was kind of a newbie in this business. You, you, you took the time to get to know me. If, if you were to get to know some of the guys who are coming up in the field now, the, the next generation who's looking to continue the legacy of storytelling in, in Chicago, uh, be part of this tradition of journalism, what would you tell them? Um, One thing, you just, kill, them? just kill the negativity. You, you, you know, we all know what we're dealing with and things aren't like we want it. But, but, but the negativity is not going to bring about anything. Do your job. Do it well. You, you'll be blessed for it. You'll be blessed. Even if hard times go, come, God will work it out for you. I, I truly believe that. But don't manifest any negativity. It's, it, it's, it will not better your situation. You know? <laughs> and think about this. I think we make our jobs look so easy that that people 
think they're easy jobs. These are not easy jobs at all. These are not, these are dangerous jobs. You know, these are stressful jobs, you know, but I'm going to tell you something. There's millions of people right now who would gladly trade places with us. I understand that on a day-to-day -day basis, you know? So just, oh, yeah. just, just say you, you signed up for this, you know, I know, you know, just do what you need to do. Things will work out. Yeah. You fight, fight for what you need to fight for, you know, don't lay down, fight for what you need to fight for. But while you're doing that, keep a, keep a good attitude about you. Dirk, I'm going to ask you, how, how has the industry changed from when you were a young man working in Tyler, Texas, getting your first jobs here? What have some of the changes that you've seen, um, which have changed the workflow for better, for worse, for, for whatever it is? I can tell you technology has def definitely changed our workflow where uh, we're not necessarily, I mean, think about it. We go and do daily press conferences at the Thompson Center and I'm doing it off a backpack. How would we, ha we would have had to lug up heavy equipment uh, 15 years ago to try to get a signal out, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a mini mic or I'm sure they the fiber lines probably would have worked, but maybe a mini mic or something like that. So technology has kind of made things easier for us. But I think right now, especially for what we do, uh, people don't appreciate us like they should. Think about it. We're, we're you know, people... I really don't like being called a cameraman because that's basic. I, I'm a photojournalist. I, I, I edit, I shoot, I transmit video. You know, sometimes you have to play producer out there. Sometimes you have to play a diplomat. Sometimes you have to be a peacemaker out there. There's so many levels to what we do, you know? And um, I think uh, you've never seen in, in Chicago, Maybe in smaller markets, but you've never seen it in Chicago what we're doing, what we're wearing so many hats. You know, we're doing a lot out there. You know, uh, you're absolutely right. right. Um, I'm going to take us back to your uh, days at CLTV to answer this question that we have here. Uh, what's Derek's funniest story from CLTV? Oh, what's my funniest story? Who put me on the spot right now? <laughs> you know what? I'll take the blame for that. Uh, I won't throw anyone under the bus, but not now he's got me curious too. Okay, I'm going to tell a safe, funny story because it's some wild stories. I'm going to tell a safe story. But, um, you know, we were doing a shoot at Theater in Rosemont, and younger people may not know who Mickey Rooney is, but I remember, you know, growing up, we used to watch his movies on Family Classic, like Boys Town and some of the other things. So my mother used to like Boys Town. So he came out in an interview with us. He was, I mean, nice as could be, cool. He came out, man, cocky like this. He's about 5'1", but he was real nice. I said, Mickey, can you do me a favor? He, 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 he's eating a uh, Baby Ruth candy bar. I said, Mickey, can you do me a big favor? He said, yes, sir. I said, my mother is a huge fan. Can you just talk to her? He said, what's your mother's name? I said, Barbara. I, I call him up. I call her up, I'm sorry. I said, hey, Ma, somebody wants to speak to you. So he, hey, Bob, how you doing? I was, she's like, okay. Hey, I just thought you know I want to hear with your son, Derek. Great kid, great kid. You know, hey, you doing okay today? She said, yeah, I'm doing fine. Okay, Bob, you know, I just wanted to say hi to you. You have a nice day, okay? Uh, she said, okay, you have a nice day as well. She don't know who it is. So <laughs> he gives me the phone back. And she said, Derek, who was that? I said, that was Mickey Rooney. Wow, wow. <laughs> You gonna tell me that was Mickey Rooney? You gonna tell me that was Mickey Rooney? You know, so she went crazy. That's, that's a safe story. That's, that, a, that's safe. a safe story. And if you want to hear the unsafe stories, maybe we'll do a, a separate <laughs> uh, private uh, podcast later because now you got me curious. Derek, um, we're obviously living in situations now. And again, this is why we're doing this because we want to keep us connected. This is an opportunity to share, to uh, do things that we usually do in the streets. Now we're physically separated. What's it like? You're obviously a big sports fan. What's it like with um, the cancellations that we had to go through? We're very grateful now, very lucky. Um, a lot of our guys who work in sports, especially in our unions, have been posting pictures about getting back to work. But what has it been like for you? Um, are you primarily a news or a sports photographer? A little bit I'm of everything. I'm everything. But I, I did do a lot of sports. Like the White Payne and Pat Keaton are like the two main sport sports guys at Channel Seven. Okay. And I say I'm a pro myself and Mike Maher. We're probably a close third and fourth. 
And so I did a lot of nighttime stuff. Like I would be that guy at night to go into the locker room and do post game, whether it was White Sox, uh, Bulls, Blackhawks, or Cubs. Probably the only people I didn't do on a consistent basis was the Bears because it was always on a Sunday or other people had it covered, you know. So I'm, I kind of missed that. You know, it gave you a break from serious news, you know. And so I, I do miss that going to the ballparks, hearing the fans cheer and everything, and just you know covering the teams. I, it, it'll get back; things will come back. Well, absolutely, and um, you know this hour kind of went by real fast. But I want to give you an opportunity. You've been very engaging and entertaining the whole way. Kind of, kind of give the viewers here like like, like some final words. Um, what do you want to say? I've asked enough questions. You, you do you. Uh, just to the viewers out here and those who don't work in TV, I mean, we, we really are out here trying to tell the real story. It, it, we aren't perfect with that, and we miss the mark sometimes, but we, we, we really – we are not out here to jam people up. We, we, we care. We care about the community. I'm a child from North Lawndale, from the west side. You know, I care about the community. I, 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 I don't want to see harm come to people. I want to tell a good story. When I go out into the community, I want to tell a fair story. I want to engage people. If I see that young man, I'll give you a perfect example. We're at the Thompson Center, and we're setting up for a live shot. A young man came up throwing gang signs. Had he did that five or ten years ago, I would have yelled at him, probably said something kind of offbeat to him. Yeah. I just told him, I, I, walked, I said, come over here. Man. I said, come here. And I, and I, talk, I, I didn't yell. I talked to him quietly. I said, why don't you let me show you something that's going to bring you life instead of something that you're doing right now that's going to eventually bring you death, you know? And the kids paused, and so I ran them through everything. I showed them what I was setting up for. I showed them the camera. I showed them the DeGero. I said, this is how I'm going live. And, 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 and so he could understand. I said, you see your cell phone you have? He's like, yeah. I said, imagine six of those tiny cars in this box and you could go live anywhere in the, in the United States. And uh, the kid, he, he sat and listened to me. He watched me for a while, and then he said thank you and told me back. You know, and, you know, I try to reach out to, to young kids when I when I can. I can. You know what I'm saying? So I just want the community to know we are not out, out here trying to jam you up. We want to tell a fair story. We really do. Well, that sounds great. Uh, I was going to let you off the hook with that one, but uh, a question came in that I that I think is really great that I want to ask you. Uh, one last question, Mitch asks: Who were some of your broadcasting heroes, Derek? My broadcasting heroes. Hmm. Well, I got quite a few at the station right now. There's so many of them right now. You know, uh, Alan Krzyzewski, Jim Rose, Margie and Greco, Cheryl uh, Burden. Uh, I mentioned them because they've been there 20 plus years, you know. And, you know, I got a lot of other friends like uh, Rob Elgis and, and, and Karen Jordans and people like that. But, I think the people that really have been there 20 plus years because I never dreamed that I would be working with these people and I call these people my friends now. I take somebody like Jim Rose. I mean, he was 12. No, I was 12. I'm sorry. When he, when he started at Channel 7, I can remember him being the MC at my homecoming my sophomore year. And now, man, like, I go back in sports before the COVID thing and, and laugh and joke with him. You know what I'm saying? We, we've we traveled together before. We've covered uh, uh, um, Stanley Cups together. We've covered NBA playoffs together. We've covered Super Bowl together. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, somebody like that, you know, um, Alan Krzyzewski, man. Um, uh, I lost my wife, man. I look up. There he was coming uh, through the emergency room. I couldn't believe it. The check on me. Him, Rob Elkis, uh, Bar Markoff, uh, one of our wonderful producers, Ross Widener, another wonderful producer, uh, Joyce Fisher, our secretary. They all rushed in through that emergency room to make sure I was okay. Um, um, Cheryl Burton, Jose Sanders, uh, wonderful people. Just, just wonderful people. Evelyn Holmes, so many names. Stacy Barker, so many people uh, to name. But I can say this real quick. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, two old school guys, and that would be Bob Petty and Frank Matthew. Though I want to say Frank started at Channel Seven in maybe '67. I might be wrong, 
Uh, Bob started in 71. So it's one guy started before I was even born. One that started when I was one years old. I've had the opportunity to work with both of them. And for both of those men to tell me it's a pleasure working with you, that, that touches your heart. That, that humbles you that you were a baby when these men started in the business. And for them to give you that ultimate compliment, it's an absolute pleasure to work with you. That, that hits you. That hits you hard. Well, Derek, I want to say it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. And just Thank like you, you had, uh, you know, those people who you respected um, give you that compliment. I want to give you a compliment from the younger generation who you touch that that it really means a lot when you go out of your way like you did. And, and just have that conversation. Just talk to someone that you don't know. You know, uh, you see a new face sometimes. They're like, who's this guy? You're trying to feel him out. But right. to actually just have a kind word and have that discussion with them goes a long way. And I want to thank you for being uh, one of the guys who did that for me when I was starting in this market. Um, and with that, we are going up. Oh, there you are. Um, and so, Derek, thank you can again you so me? much. Yeah, I can see you and I can hear you. So um, okay. thank you again for, for that. And thank you for spending the last hour with us and kind of telling where it is that you're coming from, Derek. Um, really appreciate it. And I can tell from these comments here that that people enjoyed watching it as well. I'll see you on the streets uh, next week when I'm uh, back at work. Talk to you later. All right. Take care. All right. All right have a good one, okay? You too. Bye.